Okay, so uh, continue with the second talk from Graciela. Hello? Okay. With the second talk from Graciela, and then later we're going to have uh, Ivone talking about dark side experiment yeah. shortly afterward. Okay? So. Okay, this works. All right, thank you. So I think we, we finish here uh, the mass. Um, uh, and, and, and here we have a, a whole uh, set of dark matter particles. For now, I will concentrate on, on dark matter, as I said. So point number seven, when we get to eight, we are done. The bulk of the dark matter is cold or warm, and that means non-relativistic or almost non-relativistic when dwarf galaxy core size structures start forming when the temperature is about KV. So this double dark model works well. Um, the double dark in which of the um, po 0.7 of the content of the universe is in dark energy and the rest in dark matter. This is what I'm calling the double dark. Um, most likely, the uh, dark energy is a cosmological constant. This is called some sometimes uh, lambda. And if the dark matter is cold, then it's called CDM. And so this is called lambda CDM. But could be lambda uh, WDM, warm dark matter. So, um, uh, that uh, uh, hot dark matter was uh, ruled out in the first simulations of structure formation in the 1980s. And this is what I mentioned in our, in our discussion towards the end. Only uh, structures in non-relativistic matter, uh, when, when you have matter, not when you have uh, relativistic particles, can survive. And so if you have, for example, uh, neutrinos, this was a... Uh, um, several electron volt neutrinos, uh, they become non-relativistic um, when the uh, horizon is as big as uh, the um, superclusters or clusters. So supercluster would form first, and and then the rest uh, galaxies, the smaller clusters, galaxies, etc., would have fr uh, to form through fragmentation. This is not the universe we live. Uh, we should see much, much uh, more uh, structure in, in, in larger scales than what actually we see. Uh, so this was rejected right away, uh, hot dark matter. Uh, with warm dark matter, only structures, dwarf galaxy cores size and larger survive. Namely, uh, all, the, all the ones that before enter into the horizon or are encompassed by the horizon, while dark matter is relativistic and therefore they are erased. Uh, in CDM, structures are much smaller, um, even much smaller than galaxy size survive. So galaxies form bottom-up by coalescence of many, many uh, smaller substructures that are incorporated in the larger ones. So this is, again, this is the power spectrum, essentially. And there will be a cutoff here uh, is if the uh, uh, dark matter will be hot, uh, which w we do not certainly see. But here, there could be a, a, a cutoff at the scale of dwarf galaxies. So it is the physics of the small scales, the scales of subhalos within, within the dark, dark halos like of galaxies like ours, or dwarf galaxies that actually make a difference. Distinguishes between cold dark matter, warm dark matter, self-interacting dark matter, mixed dark matter, and baryonic effects. There are baryonic, the baryonic effects are many times not included. Now in the, in the um, newer simulations, they are. Baryonic effects that contain you know, all this um, uh, uh, formation, for example, of supernova, explosion of supernova. The explosion of supernova generates um, jets that uh, clear up also the dark matter, etc. So these are very complicated effects that are uh, being uh, simulated at the moment. All of this at subgalactic scale is where most of the structure formation simulations and observational efforts are directed at present. Um, so if here you have uh, the power spectrum, a particular um, detail of it, and uh, you see that actually uh, cold dark matter or warm dark matter um, is uh, distinguished by the cutoff. Warm and dark matter would have a, a smaller cutoff than, uh, sorry, warm dark matter has a cutoff where cold dark matter doesn't. If the um, dark matter has 
thermal or close to thermal. For example, um, uh, um, sterile neutrinos don't have exactly, depending on how they are formed, but th they don't have exactly a thermal uh, spectrum, but they have close enough a thermal spectrum. Then Warner matter requires that the mass of the particle is about the kg. Um, now, what about neutrinos? Neutrinos are the only dark matter, uh, the only candidate for dark matter, neutral, etc., uh, that we have in the standard model. Um, but uh, we know the limit on the mass uh, coming even from uh, s um, CMD measurements, uh, early universe me measurements, and so on. And we know it cannot constitute more than a few percent. Um, so um, neutrinos are hot dark matter. Neutrinos are the only dark matter candidates we have. So if we want particle dark matter, we need uh, beyond the standard model physics. Now, um, particle dark matter candidates might have always the right relic density, and many of them are remnants from before the temperature of the universe was 5 MeV. So um, in order to uh, compute their relic abundance and even the, the, the momentum distribution, um, we have to make assumptions on the universe from before the, the uh, uh, five, 5 MeV. And usually it's assumed that the universe is radiation dominated and, and uh, the content is given by the standard model. But it could be actually there are models uh, and actually uh, Antonio, I'm, I'm still using <laughs> of Antonio's scalar tensor model. There are models, there are actually uh, several, several models that are non-standard. They, they are compatible with everything else. And in which, I mean, if any of them is, uh, happens to be correct, then the relic density and, and, and even relic momentum distribution would be very different for the dark matter particles that are produced then. So, um, so the message is that if we have any of these dark matter whose properties are fixed uh, uh, before the, the temperature was 5 MeV, and we measure any of them, they will be the earliest relic. So they will tell us not only a lot about dark matter uh, in terms of particle physics, but they will tell us a lot about cosmology uh, from an epoch from which we don't have yet any remnant. So which beyond the standard model physics? Well, there are many, many, many candidates for dark matter. Um, and I would like to start with a little bit of history. Um, the scope of dark matter particles has changed with time. In the 1970s and 80s, all the models for beyond the standard model physics were uh, based on trying to solve the problems uh, that remain uh, open in the uh, by the standard model of particle physics, N namely, for example, the the electroweak um, scale, um, uh, uh, the, the the problem of the hierarchy. Uh, if you have any other new physics at the higher scale, how do you stabilize the electroweak uh, scale? Uh, that would be one. Um, but also uh, the strong CP problem. Uh, we will have lectures about that. Uh, the Pacheco-Quinn symmetry was proposed for that. For to solve the strong CP problem, or in neutrino masses, how do you have neutrino masses? You put a sterile neutrino. The fact of having um, dark matter particles was an afterthought, sincerely. Um, it was not the main uh, purpose, but so for example, in supersymmetry, uh, R parity, which is the one that stabilizes the lightest supersymmetric particle that makes it a good, uh, a good uh, candidate, it was not created really to make uh, dark matter in any way. It was created to prevent proton decay. Uh, so it was not really, none, none of these models were created to be dark matter. So now this was in the 70s and 80s. As uh, the dark matter problem became more evident and it became more evident that actually new particles were needed to explain the dark matter. In the 90s, it was required, it was mandatory to have a dark matter particle in any, uh, dar in any st uh, beyond the standard model um, mm, that you proposed. You had to have this dark matter. Uh, it became mandatory. And then in the 2000s, um, due to uh, an enormous increase in the searches for dark matter, there were hints, hints in indirect detection, hints in direct detection. 
people tried to mo make models that would explain the hints. Forget about the standard model. Who cares? I mean, if you can actually explain several of these hints together and they coalesce, they, co they, they go to the same candidate, you would have a dark matter. In, in many of these models, you do have some predictions too for the LHC, but your primary um, ob objective was actually to produce models for dark matter. Now, once you take the genie out of the bottle and you say, hey, there is all this enormous amount of models that all of them can be dark matter, uh, good models, they are allowed by anything else, they don't have any relation with solving any problems with standard model, who cares? They are there, you have to take them into account. And therefore, there is an enormous amount of models. These models that are created to explain um, uh, the, uh, the dark matter, many of them have whole sectors, as I mentioned, light particles. So if you have light particles, uh, why you have you not discovered them? The LHC hasn't seen particles, either because you don't produce many of them or because you don't produce any because they are too heavy. You don't have enough energy to produce them. But if they are light, they must be in not, not have been detected yet because they interact, um, they have very small couplings. These very small couplings are called these portals. So you have, I show you one actually, you have a portal through the photons, for example, if you have this kinetic mixing, but there could be others, right? Uh, with neutrinos, with the Higgs, etc. Very small couplings. And so there is a, this whole range of uh, uh, models um, that are perfectly uh, valid and that, you know, the dark matter may, may point to any of them. So this has changed even our models for WIMPs, actually. So uh, some members of this particle, sorry, so, uh, this particle zoo. WIMPs did not uh, start uh, with uh, supersymmetry or any of these models. They started actually the first WIMP in the 1970s was a heavy standard model neutrino when still the tau or something could be actually 5 GB or something like that, right? Then people realized shortly after in, uh, that actually supersymmetry, the lightest supersymmetric particle could be actually a good WIMP. And then you realize that actually any of the models that you produce, a little Higgs inner doublet model, uh, uh, every, any one of these actually can produce a, a candidate for WIMP, a weakly interactive particle, then namely uh, a particle that interacts with interactions that are not, mu not much weaker than weak. Um, and typically has a, um, uh, a mass in the GeV to 100 GeV so this is WIMP. If it's produced, usually uh, it's assumed to be uh, produced via th um, thermal equilibrium and freeze out, but there are many other ways that we return to this. Uh, now, um, as I mentioned, there are many other competing candidates. FIMPs, feebly interacting massive particles are some of them, or frozen in massive particles. They have interactions of order much weaker than weak, much, much weaker than weak. So they have very small couplings. Some models are uh, modular or modulinous in a string theory compactifications with mass generated by weak scale supersymmetry breaking. Some right-handed neutrino, S neutrino in, in direct neutrino models with weak scale SUSY, which require very small couplings, 10 to the minus, so these are very small, eh? 10 to the minus 14, 10 to the minus 13, things like that. Um, and so on, gut scale suppressed inter interactions, uh, dark matter with kinetic mixing through uh, different portals, Higgs portal, etc. The production is that they never reach equilibrium. They are frozen in as dark matter, namely they are produced at a, certain, at a certain rate through annihilation of other particles. They are produced, 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 then the annihilation or decay ceases, and the amount that you produce, you produce. That's the freeze, freeze in. Um, the typical mass, well, it could be between sub-electron volts and hundreds of keV, it's a very long range. SIMPs, strongly interacting massive particles. The old uh, idea for SIMPs in the old models in the 1990s, they had a strong interactions with the standard model particles. Those were rejected, so now the idea was revived as a strongly self-interacting, but with very small interactions with the um, very weakly capital standard model. 
So there are several models, uh, Sun and Burgos and Bolsons, of a strongly coupled helium sector, etc. The production is uh, through thermal equilibrium a freeze, freeze out, but only in the dark sector. So they uh, produce they, are produ they produce three to two or four to two uh, dark matter interactions. So all this happens in the dark sector. Is um, and 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 the mass between hundreds and k kV and tens tens of MeVs. They are good candidates for light dark matter. It's slightly lighter than WIMPs. And then these are uh, others. PIMPs, Planckian interacting massive particles. Uh, GIMPs, gravitational interacting massive particles. These are all particles that have typically Planck scale. They have Planck also uh, gravitational strength interactions, etc. And the production is um, in uh, during their inflationary um, the end of, of the inflationary period. Well, I'm not going to talk much about axions because we will have a lot of axions out, axion like, um, uh, or wisps. Wisps are ALPs, which are bosonic plus something like uh, dark photons. They are all weakly interacting slim particles, but I'm not going to mention more than that. And there, there are still more. For example, dynamical dark matter, DDM, is a dark sector with a vast number of particle species whose, whose standard model decay widths are balanced against their cosmological abundance uh, in such a way that the short-lived have a smaller densities and so on. So the component of the composition of dark matter changes on the time. I mentioned mirror dark matter, a hidden dark sector is a copy of the standard model. Wimpsilas, uh, heavy particles created during the reheating phase after inflation, Cue balls in non-topological solitons created as fragmentation of a scalar condensate and also sterile neutrinos. So it's not lack of um, uh, uh, ways or uh, lack, lack of uh, different type of model. Also, the way of producing um, thermal uh, means particles reach equilibrium and then decouple. This is for WIMPs and SIMPs. But there are many non-thermal. For example, freezing due to out of equilibrium annihilations or decays in the FIDM, uh, freezing uh, dark matter, or due to mechan quantum mechanical oscillations. This is the freezing, the sterile neutrinos are created in this way through, um, through oscillations with active neutrinos. And then bosons, uh, formation of a condensate, decay of a uh, uh, network of a strings or during the reheating after inflation, as I mentioned. So there are many different ways, many different candidates, many different ways of producing them. So uh, thermal WIMPs. Um, so uh, this, is, this is one of the uh, most, this is what is called the WIMP miracle. Some people call it the WIMP miracle. Uh, why is it the miracle? Because um, if you make this assumption, so you start with the universe that is radiation dominated, uh, this is the usual assumption, um, uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, you assume that WIMPs reach thermal equilibrium uh, in this uh, radiation dominated period. You also usually assume that there is no particle antiparticle asymmetry in the WIMPs. Then there is the coupling when the interaction rate becomes uh, smaller than the expansion rate. So here you have uh, this is the number of particles per co-moving volume. You have a Boltzmann factor while they are in equilibrium. And at some point, annihilation ceases when these particles become so rare that they cannot meet each other uh, to uh, annihilate. And you can see, actually, if you uh, understand intuitively that cross-section is actually the area that these particles present to each other. In reality, the cross-section has only the actual interpretation of area in the rest frame of the target, right? Uh, but, you know, extend this, and it is the area that they present. If they have larger cross-sections, larger area, they keep meeting each other, even if they are rarer. If they are very uh, small cross-sections, okay, uh, they, they stop interacting earlier, right? So this is the story of the, the, the wheat prevail. <laughs> uh, so the... The ones with a smaller cross-section actually have a larger density. So this is omega is the density divided by the critical density. 
um, which is the density of the universe right now. A little h is uh, a, a measurement, is, is uh, 0.7, it's a, it's a measurement of the Hubble expansion, particular units. And this has to be about, uh, it's about 0.11 for uh, dark matter. So you see that this is the miracle, that all this is story and the value of the Hubble expansion, etc., are due uh, things that are related to our universe. But this cross-section, this cross-section depends on your model. And if you put their weak interaction cross-sections, namely this is, is the Fermi constant, right? It's essentially g squared over the mass of the W squared. If you put an, a typical annihilation cross-section which is weak, you get something that li gives you the right density. This is a miracle. Seems a conspiracy between weak interactions on one side and and the properties of the universe where we live in. And that, uh, so, but you know, miracles uh, get you only that far. <laughs> uh, yes. No, this is re this is non-relativistic. Yes, exactly. These are heavy uh, particles. These are non-relativistic, right? Uh, they decouple, in fact, uh, when the, this decoupling uh, the frees out is the mass over 20, right? Yeah, so they are all, uh, they are non-relativistic non at the moment uh, they decouple. Now, there are some limits coming from uh, Fermilat on this WIMP uh, miracle, and I will devote some attention to this. Um, by the way, this, uh, this bracket means average over thermal distribution of momenta. So knowing the distribution of momentum is important too, but here you assume that they were in equilibrium. So this is an average over initial and sum over final. Um, I'm going to devote some time because uh, there have been really um, in the news some rumors of the death of WIMPs, in particular here the WIMP miracle hope for dark matter is dead. Although I agree with this other one, rumors of the WIMP miracle's death has been greatly exaggerated. But this, this, uh, this issue of WIMPs are dead, actually, is, uh, I think in part is bad rap of all the people who favor other candidates. Um, but in part is, is an oversimplification of what this actually has been achieved. So um, let me mention the following, that when you put actually the actual calculation, here you have a better rendition of what is on the in the denominator of omega h squared. This a and b are here uh, the components of the uh, annihilation cross-section. This corresponds to an S-wave annihilation. This corresponds to a P-wave annihilation. P-wave cor corresponds to angular momentum, annihilation with angular momentum. So this is a... Um, so A and, and, and B square correspond to S wave and P wave, respectively. And, and, and here you have the effective numbers of degrees of freedom. This is not, not important for what I'm going to say right now. Uh, what I just mentioned is chemical decoupling or freeze out, where the number remains fixed. But actually later, after that, there is a kinetic decoupling when the exchange of momentum with radiation bath ceases to be effective. This is for WIMPs, usually happens later. So for example, here you have a particular example for a 100 GV WIMP is about 15 MeV. At that point, the temperature, uh, the characteristic momentum, um, ceases to be um, uh, in, in, in good thermal contact actually, and the velocity just will shift. The velocity of, of uh, non-relativistic particles goes as one over the scale factor of the universe. So here you have just a red shift. So uh, after uh, this WIMP, if you, if you see what happens after this temperature, uh, I can compute the velo characteristic velocity and then the red shifting of this velocity, and you can see that the, the WIMPs become really cold. As time goes, for example, if you, ha if you are, I put here just uh, some numbers, if you put here the temperature 10 electron volts, which is just before BBN emission, uh, this uh, velocity is 10 to the minus 8 C. Huh? So uh, WIMPs become, dark matter in general, become colder and colder and colder, and then they heat up when they fall into potential wells. 
so they lose, of course, potential energy they can introduce kinetic energies. For example, in our galaxy, um, the characteristic velocity is 10 to the minus 3. This is very important for what comes because of the following. Here you have, so you have seen many times, I'm sure, this. Direct detection is, uh, looks for energy deposited within a detector. So in direct detection, you're looking at this uh, from this way. Dark matter and a, standard and a quark, for example, or a nucleus, actually goes into dark matter and nucleus. It's a scattering process. In direct detection, looks for dark matter annihilation or decay. So in this case, annihilation. So dark matter, dark matter goes to a standard model, standard model. So you see, uh, notice that in direct detection, tests dark matter annihilation. And therefore, it tests the thermal freeze out. So now, um, this is uh, data that comes from the Fermi um, Large Area Telescope, Fermi Lab. Uh, and this is uh, observing uh, 15 stacks dwarf galaxies. Uh, here, his, here are limits on the annihilation, the annihilation cross section. This is annihilation in the halo of our galaxy. These are dwarf galaxies in the halo of our galaxy. In our galaxy, the characteristic velocity of the WIMPs is 10 to the minus C. Okay? So now, this is the limit. This is where the um, sigma V that corresponds to the thermal WIMPs, this is the limit. Since the density is inversely proportional to sigma V, um, anything that is below this would be overabundant. You would have more abundance than what corresponds to dark matter. This is forbidden. So all this would be forbidden. And then here you can see, depending on the, this is for BB bar and different assumptions. Here you have a limit uh, that says that actually all thermal WIMPs below about 100 GVs, here again, it's about maybe 60 GVs or so. This is for a different channel, right? So. Um, this analysis ruled out the wind miracle benchmark uh, for masses, maybe 60 or so, or 100, depending on the mode. But this is only for S-wave annihilation. This is one thing. Why? Because P-wave annihilation, as I showed you before, is proportional to V squared. For example, if you have the annihilation of two Majorana uh, fermions, uh, the Majorana fermions annihilate into light particles only through a uh, uh, P wave. The S wave is not present. So if that would be the case, you see sigma V is proportional to V squared. And V squared um, in the early universe, ah, there is something I forgot to mention. So here is um, when the temperature is, uh, wi when uh, uh, WIMPs, uh, freeze out. Hmm? So the temperature is the, is, is the mass over 20, right? So I can compute the velocity. This is just one half of mv squared, the kinetic energy equal, equal to three halves of kT. This is the, the um, for, for, for ideal gas law, right? So this is unfortunately an, an approximately a, an ideal gas. So this is the square root of three t times the temperature. So what you get is that at the moment of freeze out, the velocity is 0.3 of C, right? 0.3 of C. And then come here again. Yeah. Um, and you can see that if p p for P wave, sigma V square, if in the galaxy has this particular value, in the early universe, it could be 10 to the 5 times larger because the velocity was 0.3 of C instead of 10 to the minus 3 of C. So these limits do not limit uh, any P wave, hmm? P wave annihilation. Same thing in the early universe. And this is CMB. That's why I made the, cal the calculation before. At the time of CMB, I, I made a computation that the um, the velocity of WIMPs, characteristic velocity, is 10 to the minus 8. Huh? 
So you see, again, this is uh, around the CMB. Annihilations, dark matter annihilation would heat up the universe close to recombination and would uh, leave an imprint in the CMB. So therefore, there are limits in the CMB due to the CMB um, due to total electromagnetic power injected. And so they extend actually to much lower masses too. And again, they do not apply to P-wave annihilation uh, because uh, at the this moment of CMB emissions, uh, the characteristic velocity is 10 to the minus 8. At the moment, they were, uh, they decoupled, which is when I want the Fermi miracle, the, the WIMP miracle to happen, the temperature was 10 to the 8 times, the velocity was 10 to the 8 times larger. So there is a factor 10 to the 16. So again, it doesn't apply to P wave annihilation. Um, there is also the same argument with pho positron spectrum that happens here. Again, doesn't apply for P wave because here um, in, in the galaxy, the velocity is 10 to the minus 3. Early on, it was 10 to the 10 to it was 0.3. So um, because of all this uh, news <laughs> that I mentioned, uh, this paper is called uh, not even a slightly dead, right? GV scale thermal WIMPs, not even a slightly dead. What they did is com they computed even for S wave uh, in a conservative manner, conservative manner. And what you see actually is that um, it what is rejected is below 20 GV. Anywhere above 20 GV is fine, up to you know many hundreds. Uh, the, then there is a unitarity limit. And the, 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 the three up region is even more if you consider that WIMPs could be subdominant. So I think that WIMPs are, even thermal WIMPs are uh, okay. But of course you could, uh, you could have some of these assumptions that enter into the production of thermal WIMPs, you could change them. For example, there could be an asymmetry in the dark matter, particles and antiparticles. The WIMPs are different, and therefore annihilation ceases, not, uh, not due to the uh, freeze-out, but actually due to the removal of all the minoritary components. They cannot annihilate anymore if they don't find antiparticles to annihilate, for example. They could, you could have a non-standard pre-VVN cosmology, as I mentioned. Uh, WIMPs may not be may be unstable and decay into the actual dark matter. This is the super WIMP scenario. Or WIMPs can be produced in the decay of other particles. If dark matter is warm, uh, cold WIMPs uh, could be a subdominant component. Even WIMPs could be warm dark matter. But they will have to be produced in, in ways very different than usual, right? Uh, being warm is not an issue of the mass. It's an issue of how relativistic these particles are uh, when the temperature of the universe is going to be. Okay. How much I have? Ten minutes? Okay. So, um, in which way it goes? Ah, it goes in, in the way that it I have seven minutes. Okay. So, um, I will talk a little bit about direct dark matter dete detection of WIMPs. Um, as you know, the in, in direct dark matter, you try to observe a dark matter WIMP moving, uh, interacting with a detector and depositing some energy. The problem with this is that the energy is not much. Also, the, um, the uh, number of events uh, is actually that, that you can expect now is, is very small. There would be an annual modulation, and then uh, because of the velocity of the sun, of the Earth around the sun, and I'm I'm going to talk mostly about non-directional, but there are some directional uh, uh, searches in which people try to see the recoil direction, not only the uh, not only the energy. Uh, there there has been a modern, you know, that um, uh, words evolve. Um, and WIMPs and light, light dark matter have evolved. Uh, light dark matter now refers, and this is a use that becomes more prevalent, for WIMPs that are light enough that wouldn't um, leave 
um, enough energy uh, in the usual um, dark matter uh, direct detection experiments, um, but they could be detected through interactions with electrons. Uh, so, for example, if you have a typically from um, mass from a kV to a GeV, if you use the velocity 10 to the minus 3 uh, of C, which is the characteristic velocity of WIMPs, then you see that the maximum is below a kV. And usually the threshold for detection in most direct dark matter is a kV. However, you could um, detect them, uh, they could detect these particles through uh, interaction with electrons. So if this is uh, detectable interactions with electrons, then it's called light dark matter. Here you have, for example, that several of these uh, dark matter um, detectors can be used also uh, to, have a, uh, to uh, explore a signal in electrons, right? And then there are many others, uh, for example, in semiconductors, you can break um, uh, scattering of electrons and uh, breaking chemical bonds in molecules or crystals. You can have multi-phonon process in superheliod or insulated crystals and so on. There are many, many ideas. And of course, I'm not going to mention anything about direct searches of very light dark matter, which are axions and so on. Light dark matter, it's not this very light dark matter. It's intermediate. It's just below uh, the, the WIMPs. So there are many direct detections. We are going to hear uh, about a few. Uh, most of the laboratories, as you see, are in the northern hemisphere, except for two. The Stowell mine, where there is an experiment already, Sabrum, this is under construction. And maybe Andes, maybe Andes here. Um, now, Dama Libra has a still a signal. There were several others, actually, whose uh, signals either disappear or they are still there. For example, there are three events in CDMN, uh, two silicon, we don't know what to do with them. Um, now, the analysis uh, of these uh, events, trying to see if they could be made compatible and compatible with all other type of uh, upper limits, uh, did not result really in having a discovery of our matter. But we learned a lot, because we learned much. Uh, we, we open up to consider more particle models and expanding the ways to compare data. Now. Um, the Dama Libra uh, uh, data still remains. At this point, um, I don't think that having, now it is, I think, nine uh, sigma. Uh, this is not going to be resolved except for data from other um, people. Uh, the, the elements of the detection rate that I'm going to talk are the, um, the interaction rate, this is in the, uh, so this is the interaction rate. It depends certainly on the um, uh, cross section and depends on the velocity distribution of WIMPs. It requires actually an integration over the velocity distribution of WIMPs. And of course, the resolution function enters the resolution. The response of the detector is, is there too. So it has three elements, detector response, cross-section, and halo mode. What has uh, changed, um, well, there are several uncertainties, of course, in the cross-section, but we, we now consider all type of cross-section, not only a spin-independent and spin-dependent, but uh, what are those that are still almost exclusively considered uh, by experimentalists. In, in dark matter detection, but many others, uh, like for example, magnetic dipole and so on, uh, or uh, pseudo-scalar exchange, they are all different and they will produce cross-sections and therefore rates that look very, very different. You see that the, uh, the strategy in order to measure uh, a, a particle that would have a, um, a rate that falls exponentially, which is mostly what the uh, dark de matter detectors point to. Um, they have only a search here uh, in, in where they expect most. Could be very different if the spectrum looks like this. Uh, actually, you wouldn't see that much very close. You would have to go farther out, enough farther out, in order to see a signal. Uh, this is important at the moment of considering what will happen um, at the, at the moment of encountering the neutrino background. Uh, 
Uh, as um, the, the uh, dark matter detectors uh, become bigger and bigger, multi-ton detectors, there will be a moment in which they will become neutrino detectors. Because there is a neutrino background, there are neutrinos coming from the sun, there are neutrinos produced uh, by cosmic rays in the atmosphere, and there is a background of neutrinos produced from earlier supernovas, the cosmic neutrinos. And those have uh, coherent interactions with the nucleus. This is the same, uh, it's indistinguishable, in will be an indistinguishable background, indistinguishable except for the spectrum. Hmm? Uh, by one by one, uh, the events will be indistinguishable. Um, so here you see that if you have, the spectrum is very, is very important at the moment of deciding how uh, to deal with the background, uh, with a neutrino background. Here you see um, different um, uh, the, the projections for the discovery limits of two different um, dark matter candidates. This one with a spin independent interaction, this one with a magnetic dipole uh, coupling. This is both of them are in xenon. And you can see, uh, uh, Due to this, these are increases in exposure of uh, 10. So uh, this is 10 years, exposures less than 10 years. This is 100, 10, 1, and 0.1 10 years. Without the background, the neutrino background, the discovery limit is, is he here given in black. Uh, with the background, uh, it becomes the uh, this one in brown. So, so here you can see that uh, for a spin independent here, practically, you can increase by 1,000 uh, from 0 0.1 to 100 um, ton years, and you will gain absolutely nothing. Uh, so here is where precisely for this mass and for this type of interaction is where you are, if, if you are in this condition, you are extremely unlikely, unlucky. But if, if you are somewhere else, you will start losing even one order of magnitude, you see here, in um, one order of magnitude in your um, discovery limit in, in mass and cross-section. Um, but however, if you have a magnetic dipole, magnetic dipole has a, uh, a spectrum that is completely different. Yeah? It uh, starts at zero, uh, yeah, as energy increases, it goes to a maximum and then a minimum. If you go to masses that are large enough that this maximum is uh, above the neutrino background, you are not affected by it. So you see that your discovery limits in this region are not affected. So you see that considering different type of interactions is essential in order to see what kind of, uh, how important it will be the neutrino background. I, I'm not sure if I should finish here. I have zero. I wanted to have to make a few comments about the halo model, but I don't know. Do I have five minutes? Okay. So, the halo model. We use what I always call the aesthetical cow of halo models. You know, a model that is simple enough, not entirely wrong, sort of okay, but nobody ex expects that it will be actually correct in last instance. So, and once you start comparing uh, the results of different um, uh, experiments using a particular halo mole, everybody uses the same. Because of course, if you change the halo mole, they all change, right? So in order to say what is better, how, it, well, how much is the improvement, and so on and so forth, you have to use the same one. So. This is the one that is uh, it's not entirely wrong, but it assumes a Maxwellian distribution um, at rest with respect to the galaxy uh, in such a way that actually the velocity of the wimp wind with respect to Earth is minus the velocity of Earth with respect to the galaxy. And our velocity with respect to the galaxy is maximum at the beginning of June and minimum six months later, because this is when uh, our velocity of rotation, actually we move at 60 degrees with respect to 
the velocity of the sun with respect to the galaxy, huh? the plane of the ecliptic is at 60 degrees, but actually our velocity sums maximally to the velocity of the sun around the galaxy in uh, the beginning of June. And so um, because of this change uh, in the relative velocity of the wimp wind, you expect a modulation, which is of the order of 10%, um, that is observed actually like the one observed by Dama. And this is what is intriguing about Dama, that actually uh, they have a modulation that is compatible with what you would expect from this type of mode. It is maximum at the beginning of the summer and minimum six months later. Unfortunately, any other um, unaccounted for um, uh, annually modulated background will have to be annually modulated by the temperature, in particular the temperature in the upper part of the atmosphere, because there is where you produce pions, and um, if the pions interact before, decay, before decaying, they lose energy, and so the, the, the muons that are producing the pions are less energetic, and they less amount of them, lesser amount of them, reaches the cavities where all these experiments are. So if the temperature is instead hotter, the upper atmosphere has, is less dense, and the pions decay before interacting. So they don't lose energy in interactions. They produce pions that are more energetic, more of them uh, get to the cavity, and when they interact in the walls, they produce radon and whatnot. So any background that you can imagine that will have an annual modulation will be maximum in summer and minimum in winter. This is why it is so important to make an experiment that will be equivalent to DAMA or something like that in the southern hemisphere, in which now we will have at least one, one uh, cavity in the Stowell mine and hopefully a laboratory in Andes, right? Because uh, in, in the northern hemisphere, uh, the, this uh, modulation of the signal that you expect is practical in the summer and in the winter, maximum in summer, minimum in winter. But if you would go to the southern hemisphere, uh, it, will, it will have the opposite. I mean, the, this, the signal of dark matter shouldn't change, but the backgrounds would change and will have the opposite face. So for all the backgrounds that you cannot even imagine that they exist, that have an annual modulation, you should go to the southern hemisphere and, and test, right? And for something so fundamental as this, better you test. So we need laboratories in the southern hemisphere. This is a shameless propaganda for Andes. Okay. So uh, we have many, uh, f first of all, in all simulations, you have at least a thousand, 10 to the three particles, right? So what happens at the scale of the Earth is completely unknown in simulation. And, and moreover, you can have tri triaxialities, you have all these uh, structures in velocity, you could have a dark disk, etc. cetera. Huh? So the issue is uh, why not to try to not to use any model for the halo? And you can do that. So here you have, the again, the rate. So if you assume a dark matter model, you can compute this uh, integral. Uh, the integral is this eta, that is the integral over the velocity or the speed distribution. Uh, you have eta, uh, you assume particular density, um, and then uh, you put a limit on a constant that you take out from the cross-section, a reference cross-section, and the mass. This is what the usual plots are uh, given in a mass and sigma reference plot. A halo independent instead would be the following. You assume a particular dark matter candidate. For dark matter candidate, you make your prediction on this function eta. And then you compa compare the predictions of the halo of different experiments. If they are all detecting the dark matter, your prediction for the local halo should be the same. So your predictions for this function, eta, should be the same. They are not too bad. They are not observing the same thing. Or the candidate that you assume is wrong. So this is the uh, halo. Now let me go to uh, the, the difficulty in this. So uh, the prediction is, the, 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 the method is to actually make a prediction on a function 
that is within a convolution. And this is where the difficulty, uh, the main problem is. Because likelihood methods are good for parameter estimation. Parameter estimation, not to estimate the function. And this is what you have in this model. So, uh, for example, this is a rate, expected rate. You can always write it as an integral with a kernel that is particle dark matter dependent and also dependent on the uh, detector, is detector and particle dependent, and a function that depends only on the halo and is common to all detectors. You can write it uh, in this way also, an integration by parts. So eta is an integral of the velocity distribution. So you can write it in this way. So what you're trying to infer is the velo local velocity distribution of WIMPs using detection rates, right? This is the, the problem. And uh, I must say that after a lot of work, and I'm not going to say, I think that we solve this problem mathematically using um, a convex geometry. And unfortunately, this is such a, in spite of all our efforts, um, the language is completely um, foreign to particle physicists. So nobody reads our paper uh, to my chagrin. Uh, because <laughs> I think that this is essentially what we uh, uh, did. And this is an example. This is only if you consider uh, average rates. For average rates, uh, what these theorems tell you is that the maximum you can say is to write this. You can always maximize the likelihood by using a, a parameterization of this in this way that is fixed by these theorems. So if the velocity distribution, in this case is the speed distribution because I'm considering only average rates, so I'm considering an average over the, over the year, um, is the sum of delta functions, delta functions in a speed. The delta functions in a speed, uh, this sum has two parameters. One is where the delta function is in a speed is, and the other is the amplitude. So for each data point, the, for each data point that you have, the data points may be uh, your data in different bins or just particular single events, uh, you would have one of these terms. So for every data point that you will get in non-directional and direct detection, you could determine your speed distribution at one speed. That gives you now the two parameters. This is, this is now a 2D parameter, and now you use your favorite method for parameter estimation using likelihoods. Uh, now, I, I really like this because it was a lot of work to get to this result, but uh, really the method is not well uh, developed yet for experimentalists to use and so on. We, we need to develop it more. But uh, we have it in a good... Uh, so this is uh, an outlook. Um, we have many different detectors, but in particular, now there is, I don't know if you know, there is a global sodium iodide with thallium uh, doping, a collaborative effort. There are um, three different experiments, actually four, KIMS and DMIs in Yang Yang Laboratory in South Korea, ANIS in Can Frank in Spain, and SABRE that has two sites, one is the Gran Sasso and the other is Tawel Mine. And in total, they have a tonnage that will allow them to have some comparison with uh, DAMA data with sodium iodine. But we expect it in maybe five years or so, or something like that. And then uh, we are going to hear, for example, dark side and dark side 20 tons in, in construction, Sinon and ton, um, Darwin, yeah, if they get to 50 ton, and this uh, new um, development of um, the global Argon a project, um, and so on and so forth. And uh, I have, sorry for, this is my last thing. So there are no compelling observational or experimental evidence in favor of any of our dark matter candidates. So actually we need to cast as wide a net as possible. This is a very, very vibrant field with many new ideas and a strong worldwide commitment to the effort and will continue bringing results for decades. So if you want to get into dark matter detection, this is a great time to get into any aspect of the dark matter problem. 
there are very mature WIMP search techniques which should continue. Do not believe people who said uh, WIMPs are dead, and this is not true, actually. Um, mature WIMP techniques that should continue to the multitone scale and to reaching the neutrino floor in such a way that it constitutes a true barrier. And what constitutes a true barrier depends is, is dependent on the type of interactions, as Ashi, I just show you. Dark matter searches are advancing very fast in all fronts. Lots of data necessarily lead to many hints, but you know many of them are not right. But hopefully someday several of them will point to the same dark matter boundaries, and then we'll have a discovery. So uh, we are quite late. So let's leave the questions for her. On Thursday, we'll have a discussion section so we can discuss a lot more about this, uh, her results, no problem. So let's continue with Yvonne. Yvonne, you'll talk about dark soil. Mm -hmm. 